Hey everyone, welcome to the Pregnancy After 40 podcast. I'm your host, Michelle Johnson, and today I am excited to welcome Deb Flaschenberg. Um, she has really great information. I love her history. Um, she is, or she was an older mom um, giving birth to her to her two children. Um, first one at 37, second one at 40. Um, she also is a prenatal yoga instructor, childbirth educator, and a birth doula. So she puts all of those things together <laughs> and teaches other women um, how to have the best birth experience for them. I'm combining all the information and knowledge. So Deb, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate this. Yes, this is great information. So I have recently, everyone knows my story again. Um, I had two children over 40. And recently after the group um, and just finding so many women who are trying to conceive, I finally come up with like 50 fertility tips. And yoga is definitely in that list of 50 fertility tips. And one of the things, like even when I make contact with a lot of new members, um, if they're having, like, they have suggest or they want suggestions as to what they can do. One of the first things I say is like water and yoga. Like <laughs> take yoga. I put so, acupuncture in there too. I think acupuncture can be great for fertility. It's in. It's on the list. <laughs> I have it yep. on there. Um, so yeah. So I just want to one. We're going to start off with your story, mm -hmm. um, with your two um, children that you had. Again. Usually after 35, it's considered a little older. So um, we're going to put you in that group again, 30, 70, you said, and 40. Yep. And then how you got started um, with your your full, I guess, history of an experience with yoga and being a childbirth educator and being a birth doula. Because usually people have like one or the other, but you have like all three, which I think is great. So just tell us a little bit about your births um, sure. and how what you do and what you've done um, in, impacted your births. Oh gosh, my births were so very different. So I was 37 when I had my first and I thought it was going to be really hard. Um, I was very fortunate. It was easy to get pregnant, but the, the birth itself was very long and I wasn't expecting that. So I had already been um, a yoga teacher. I started when I was 28. I opened the prenatal yoga center and actually taught prenatal for about uh, a year and a half before that. So I had been doing and teaching prenatal yoga for 10 years. And I thought that my babies would just walk out because this is what I do. Um, I thought it'd be easy, but it was, it was a challenge. And you know, that challenge served me in a sense that I think had it been really easy, I may not have had quite the compassion and empathy um, about a challenging birth. And it taught me so, so much. So I was still doing my yoga. I was still doing probably what I would say now is too much of the strength training I was doing. I think it made things a little tight. Um, and from that experience of having a very challenging birth, I, I changed how I taught prenatal yoga. I really looked at the body and I looked at, is everything balanced in the body? What's going on with the pelvic floor? Um, so that first birth taught me a lot. So that's when I was 37. And from that experience at being a challenging birth, I also had to rehab a lot. Uh, my pelvic floor really suffered. My abdominals really suffered. So when I got pregnant with my second, right before, maybe a couple months before 40, at my 40th birthday party, I was pregnant. Um, I went about things very, very differently. I changed how I practiced yoga. I changed the exercises I did. I really changed the whole structure in which I taught. And I changed what I did for my whole, just even coming home and relaxing. I wouldn't recline on my back. I was on my side. I was really focused on baby position. So while my first birth in total was a grand uh, 42 hours with five hours of pushing. My second, which are statistically shorter, let's just say that, but my second was the whole active, like the intense part was maybe four hours and I'd say less than six minutes of pushing. At one point, um, my midwife got me back into the bed just to chill out because I was in the shower for a while. And all of a sudden I yelled, I think something's coming out. Oh <laughs> and she gosh. looked and the bag of water was breaking. But in my head, I thought, this can't be the baby's head because it doesn't really hurt. So where my first, I pushed for five hours and I, it took every fiber of my being 
to birth that baby, my second one basically kind of marched herself out, which is kind of really it's interesting. When I look at my kids' personalities, my second child is <laughs> all about like, let me help you. How? What can we do together? She's such a team player. Um, so it doesn't surprise me in that sense that she's like, mom, I'm coming. Um, and my first one's a little more challenging, um, a little more stubborn. So <laughs> their personalities mm. showed up, I think, in their births. But it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about how to support people even though I had been a labor support doula and I'd attended over 100 births by that point, it did give me a different perspective of how I wanted to show up for people and how I wanted to help support them find a better possible birth. Okay. So did you attribute the change in the yoga positions and all those things, did you attribute that to basically the easier birth with I your do. second? You do. I do. I really focused. So I started working with a physical therapist um, after my first. And I also studied, started studying a methodology called spinning babies. And I learned about pelvic balance. I learned about the pelvic floor in a much deeper way. I knew about these things, but I didn't take them as much in consideration as the inside of the pelvis, the soft tissue, the uterus, everything had to be more balanced. And the poses I was doing as a yoga practitioner weren't always adding to that. Sometimes I think some of the things I was doing is actually tightening the pelvic floor, tightening the psoas. I was still on my spin bike for my first, and that tends to tighten up the pelvic floor and the psoas. So I changed the way I practiced. I changed my activity, but I also started my acupuncture and chiropractic. Um, I was working, um, I did the Webster technique, and that's about finding so to a different approach, I attribute it to it being a second birth. I attribute it to the different poses I was doing and really looking about how to soften the pelvic floor because for me, my pelvic floor was very tight and that was inhibiting the bounciness that we need for baby to descend and rotate and, and emerge well. Okay, just so I know, because I've been hearing about the pelvic floor a little bit more lately, um, especially in a lot of research that I've been doing. So I didn't really hear about the pelvic floor when I was actually pregnant. So can you actually tell us what that is and what sure. you did to actually soften your pelvic floor? Yeah. So I wish I had, I have a pelvic floor uh, model that I bring up for class. Um, I don't remember exactly how many muscles are included, but we have the superficial, we have a middle layer of a deeper, a deeper layer. And the deeper layer specifically can get rather tight and cause tension. And we ideally want the pelvic floor, I think of it like a jellyfish or like a spring, a trampoline. We want it to have undulation. That's where the jellyfish idea comes in that when we inhale, there's that drop and spread. And when we exhale, there's that dome. So we want the pelvic floor to have full range of motion like the jellyfish. We want it to be springy and supportive, but we also need it to receive and lengthen. And for a lot of our bodies, we're walking around with these muscles recruited and tight and engaged and doesn't have the ability to receive and lengthen. So we need that pelvic floor to have both sides. It needs to support and lengthen. It needs to engage and dome. So what I was doing to help find that relaxation as I was trying to stay away from poses that really clenched and engaged. So when we can do things like um, think about, I'm going to have everyone, if they're sitting, think of the two bones, the base of their pelvis, their sit bones, you can kind of wiggle wobble from side to side. Maybe you can feel your sit bones. All right. So visualize your sit bones. Now in the front of your pelvis, you have your pubic bone, two bones that come together as cartilage. And in the back, we have the tailbone. So it's like a little diamond. And so what we're thinking when we inhale is that the muscles start to inhale and lengthen. So those four bony points, we can visualize them moving a little bit away. Now, the great thing about softening your pelvic floor, you can do it by just breathing. So when you inhale, the lungs fill, so the rib cage expands kind of like an umbrella, and then the respiratory diaphragm drops and spreads, and that naturally adds a little downward pressure of our internal organs onto the pelvic floor and it receives the organs. And so that diamond gets a little expansion, those muscles lengthen. And then when we exhale without effort, the lungs empty, the diaphragm domes, and like a little vacuum effect, it pulls up the organs. We have this natural undulation. So to help relax the pelvic floor, diaphragmatic breathing is fantastic. 
But then I also started looking at yoga poses that created space and widened the sit bones, those two bones I mentioned. So we can do things like a squat where we can think of releasing the tailbone back, letting the sit bones widen. And then one of my favorite poses in yoga, it's a forward leaning inversion where we're internally rotating the toes. Internal rotation widens the sit bones and we're hanging upside down, walking the arms forward. So the tailbone's lifted, the sit bones are widening, the pubis is releasing forward, and that poses a great pelvic floor lengthener. And it also is great for the muscles that attach, or sorry, the ligaments that attach from the cervix to the pelvis. Sometimes those get a little torqued and that can throw off um, pelvic alignment as well. So I try to throw in poses that can really set my pelvis up, my uterus up, help the baby descend and rotate. So I included that in my own practice and I include it a lot in how I teach because if we can have a better aligned body, chances are baby can be better aligned and therefore we have a more functional birth because having had a 42 hour birth, um, I don't want that for, <laughs> I don't want that for anyone. It's not, it's not fun. Yeah, that that is all so amazing to me. It, to me, it's just really amazing how much just breathing and your breathing techniques like actually affect just so many things yeah. in your body. So to me, that's that's actually it's just amazing. Um, I'm going to go back to your births really quick. Did you have home births or did you have I hospital births? I did. Um, and I know that's not the right choice for everyone. I did. Um, when I was very much in my doula life, I don't do that really right now, I thought a lot about where I would feel safest. And that's what I think people need to think. I don't ever think that anyone should choose a birth based on someone else's opinion. So I think wherever you feel safest and you can have a team that really supports you, that's where you should give birth if that's available. And I know that's not, um, that's not afforded to everyone, but I was able to have to home births. It's where I felt the safest. I had an amazing team and I, trusted that if things were going awry, they would make decisions and help me transition to a hospital. And I was also fortunate that I had the OB that I had been with since I was 22 was also someone, he was like a colleague because I saw him at, um, at the hospital often when I was a doula. So he made himself available so that should I need to transfer, he would be there, um, he would pick up the care. So I was in a really fortunate situation. I kind of had the best of both worlds. So yeah, I had, I had two had two wonderful home births. That's awesome. So you said you had a team. So I know you mentioned the midwife. Who else was in your team? At, um, at the the midwife birth? has a midwifery assistant. Um, and then I had my doula, who also happens to be my mentor, my doula mentor. So that was really special to have her. And then my husband. And then for my second, my son was kind of around, although I wasn't loving that. Um, <laughs> I needed him out of the space. So that was my birth team. Okay. That's awesome. Okay. So now we're going to go back to before you had your children um, and when you originally started. So kind of tell us how you were able to mesh. You know, you went to school, you were doing yoga, and then you became a childbirth educator, and then you became a doula. Like, tell us how that all started and how you meshed all of that, and you came up with the prenatal yoga center that you have now and run. Yeah. Um, it's backwards. Everyone would think that by having my own kids would spark this desire to work in the prenatal world. But I started, and actually I think I, I credit the fact that I was able to have this lasting studio because once I've had kids, it's a lot, kids are a lot of work. And I would not have been able to do, have my, what I call my first baby, the uh, PYC prenatal yoga center. So I was, I think 26 when I went off to do my first teacher training. And I just was not loving the style in which I had originally jumped into. And so I was talking to some of the other teachers and. And someone mentioned prenatal yoga. Now, this is back at like 2001. So prenatal yoga wasn't really a thing. It's not, it wasn't nearly as popular as it is now. So I studied, I looked, where can I find a training program? And the only one that was pretty meaty was out in Seattle. A lot of them were just like a, week, a single weekend. And this one was 100 hours. So I'm like, all right, there I go. So I head out to Seattle for a bit. And I, I took the training, I came back, I hung my shingle and I was like, here I am, I was 27 at the time. None of my friends were having kids. I came from a musical theater background. So that was the furthest thing from most of uh, what my friends were doing. And I just jumped into the world. Um, someone mentioned it, I thought it was a good idea. I talked to my mom who does marketing and she said, people are always gonna be pregnant, it's a great idea. And I, I didn't expect it to impact my life as much as it did. So somewhere within my first or second year, 
at PYC, oh, uh, I started the studio, I had a student that was doing her fellowship um, at a hospital, a teaching hospital in New York City. And she asked me if I would like to follow her around, shadow her on the L&D floor because I hadn't seen any births at that point. So it must have been my, my first year. And I was a bit horrified at what I witnessed as what she was telling me were typical hospital births. I just didn't feel like there was a lot of respect to the birthing person. I didn't feel like there was a lot of bonding that was being incentivized right there and then. The one, one birth I saw, it was, um, the parents didn't speak English and they just, they weren't being respected. And after this, well, I perceived they weren't being respected. After this baby came, for whatever reason, I was left in the, the birth room, the baby was in the little warmer and the parents were in a separate area, like just off on their bed. And no one was really talking to the parents and the baby wasn't with the parents. And it just, it seemed really, it was sad. It seemed wrong and sad as to why that golden hour of baby coming out, why the baby wasn't with the, with the parents and why no one was trying to take care of the baby and the parents and, and help this family find this bond. So when I left the hospital that day, I started looking up where can I become a doula? And I found a program that, I was already a prenatal yoga teacher, but I found a program that had prenatal yoga and a doula certification. So I thought more education, the better. So that's what created my desire to bridge the gap between what I saw happening in our paradigm of birth and what I was teaching in the asana. And I felt like I can't just teach modified yoga poses. I wanted to help support and prepare the students for what birth can look like and really give them the questions to ask and how to find that support and literally be there with them and offer support. So I became a doula. And then I kept thinking, you know, at this point I was in my late 20s, early 30s, probably maybe 29, maybe 30. And I thought, all right, I, I need to keep my education going because I did have people say, you know, you haven't had a baby, you know, what do you know? So I thought, well, I'm going to learn more. That's my Scorpio in me. <laughs> like, if you right. challenge me, I'm going to show up and give you more. So um, I did a Lamaze certification and I started, I really loved that. I love data. I love, and then I started writing some blogs and just adding the data and studies. I really enjoy that, That's that uh, research. And then I did a midwifery assistant program at this place called The Farm down in Tennessee. Um, so I just kept layering my knowledge and they just kept, the knowledge just kept feeding into class and class really became a foundation of childbirth education that I would add these little tidbits of some sort of theme about childbirth ed into class. Because we know studies show more than 50% of birthing people, they don't take a childbirth ed class. And the only time that they may actually get some of this formal education could be in prenatal yoga. So I started to interweave the education factor into the yoga classes, especially we talk about coping skills, we talk about breathing, we talk about the, the physical body and birthing positions. And it's really created its own methodology. So it's it's the yoga poses for the benefit of preparing for birth and parenthood in not just the physical, but the mental, finding confidence and, and having skills. So it's really, it's created its own methodology, which I'm really proud of. Okay, so how do you um, describe to people the difference between a doula and a midwife? So for me, just the concept of a doula is relatively new, um, mm -hmm. like within the last year or so. Um, it's not something that I, you know, would have thought of. You know, definitely would consider if I got pregnant again um, at this age. You know, I was something I would would consider. But can you just tell us the difference between a birth doula and a midwife, oh, um, yeah. especially at the at delivery? Yeah, they're totally, totally different. So the midwife is the medical professional involved. So the midwife takes the place. So if someone has an idea of what is traditional OBGYN, that's the person that's doing all of the medical, all the screening, all the checkups. They're covering the medical side, as well as the emotional side. The midwife definitely takes the emotional side. And they're going to be helping, having a conversation about medical decisions. And they're also what we call catching the baby. Um, and it, it's a, in a midwife, if 
person needed a cesarean would hand off of, um, the birthing person to an OBGYN and have a surgical birth and lift the baby. So the midwife is the medical professional and the doula is not. The doula should not be making any sort of medical decisions. Um, the, the doula is showing up for emotional support, for physical support. So the doula might be doing a lot of hands-on massage, um, all sorts of hands on there's like a, a hip squeeze to help release the sacrum there's something called shaking the apples or releasing the the hips and buttocks um so we're giving a lot of emotional support physical support and educational support or informational support so if there's a decision that needs to be made it's not up for the doula to make the decision but the doula can provide the pros and cons so if someone's saying I think we need to start Pitocin. We want to have a discussion. What's Pitocin? What are the pros and cons? Or the birthing person saying, all right, I'm thinking of an epidural. Let's talk about the pros and cons. So while the doula is not making decisions, because that's not the place for the doula, the doula can help lay the foundation for what these interventions may be. And the doula has an eye of what normal labor looks like. So I remember showing up at some of my earlier births as a new doula, and the clients were really happy and cheery. And it took me a little time to realize, okay, if they're this happy and cheery, chances are we're in earlier labor. So the doula mm -hmm. has some perspective of when we've turned the corner to active labor, when we've turned the corner to transition and then have tools to help the laboring person. Does that, does that okay. make sense? It, it does. I actually, um, I had a midwife for my daughter when I was 25, um, because at that time I just kind of was like, I just want to go as natural as possible. Um, and so I did that and she worked under the supervision of an OB. So, but I ended up not needing the OB. Um, when I had my children in my forties, that wasn't even an option with the practice that I was at. So um, that's why I was saying this definitely would be something I probably would consider now. Um, so how long does a birth doula, at least when you were doing, or if you're still doing it, do you stay after birth and in, in delivery? The after, like one and a half to two hours, more if they need. Um, but the main focus is the during. So I would show up when the person needed me and I would stay. Now, some people work in teams um, and with partners. And so some partners will, some teams will say, okay, I'm with you for 12 to 16 hours. I always worked solo, but I had a backup. So I might be at a birth for, you know, anywhere from two to 32 hours. Um, but typically after the baby is out, I'd want to make sure if they need help with any sort of initial breastfeeding that I'm there to help with the transition from the L and D room, labor and delivery room to the postpartum room. Um, oftentimes people are starving after they have their baby. So I'll make sure there's food, food for the partner, make sure everyone's comfortable and just help initiate with that early bonding. And then usually scoot away about two hours later. And then I'd come back for a postpartum visit just to check in on the family. Okay. That's great. Okay. So now I want to talk a little bit about, um, yoga and how it can be beneficial for women who are trying to conceive and also postpartum. How beneficial or helpful is yoga and during those two stages? I think it's incredibly beneficial. I don't have, it's not my specialty, the trying to conceive, but I do feel like anytime that we can bring the cortisol and the adrenaline down, then that's going to be good for helping the body be prepared and, and open spot, an open space for, um, for conceiving. I think less stress, less tension, the better. Postpartum, that's something I really enjoy. I teach um, prenatal and postnatal, those are my specialties. So postpartum, I think it's incredibly uh, helpful for the postpartum body. So when we teach postnatal, I always try to focus on, I call it the seven areas of the postnatal body that needs attendance. So we focus on the psoas muscle, those are the hip flexors, and they tend to get really stressed and tight in the postpartum body because when the back muscles have atrophied and the core doesn't have a lot of stability, these psoas muscles really, they, they take over the job. They try to stabilize. They get really, really tight and dry. So I focus on releasing the psoas muscles. We also wanted to look at the pelvic floor. So what is the state postpartum of the pelvic floor? Does it need support? Is it coming out too tight? Even if someone had a surgical birth, a cesarean, sometimes that fascia, that connective tissue that uh, is around the scar can yank and pull on the pelvic floor because the fascia is all interconnected. So we look at what's going on with the pelvic floor and I offer some general, um, some general poses and, and techniques for that. And I always, always recommend because I'm not a pelvic floor PT that if they're not getting a sense of what's going on in their pelvic 
of their pelvic floor from some of the cues I'm giving, or they just want they just want more per on one that out to a pelvic floor physical therapist that that specialty. We'll make sure there's some sort of pelvic floor engage or release. And then we're also looking at the abdominals and specifically the transfers and making sure that if there's something called diastasis recti, that's where the two sides, imagine these are my rectus abdominals, that there often is a gap. And in fact, from the studies, I've said 100% of people that had a baby have some sort of gap between the two sides, but what's going on with that connective tissue between the gap, that's what we're looking at and how to find some tensile strength and support. So we've got psoas, pelvic floor, abs, and then we work on focusing on the back because the back gets, like I mentioned, the back muscles get really atrophied and holding a baby or breastfeeding or bottle feeding or chest feeding, that's a lot of caving in. So the back gets really, uh, really tight and often weak. And then we also want to work on chest opening because if you think about holding a baby and fatigue and the emotions that happen during postpartum, the chest tends to cave in. And if someone chose to breastfeed the weight in the front body, so then we want to make sure we're doing chest openers. And then often if we're holding the baby or feeding, we're looking down a lot and the neck and shoulders get really, really tight. So, and then the last part that we make sure we hit in every postnatal class is restorative. So even if the post postpartum person is there to work out, I feel very confident saying the majority of the time they don't have a lot of chance to rest during the day. So we try to make sure we fit some restorative poses. So even if it's eight minutes of two or three different restorative, that might be their only time to really release and let go and kind of help their nervous system get back. So those are the seven areas that we focus on in postnatal. And I feel it is so incredibly beneficial. And then of course, community. We start all of our classes with a check-in so that we go around. Now it's the Zoom Brady Bunch board. <laughs> we go around the circle. But now we go in and I check in with everybody individually what's going on with their body so I know how to attend to it. And then everyone gets to know each other. And it really, the community aspect is, it's beautiful, especially now that we're in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, parenthood is isolating on a, on a good day. And now we'll talk okay. about during a pandemic. So that, that community aspect is incredibly important, incredibly um, vital for new parents. I think that restorative piece is just awesome. I've never even, you know, thought about that. Um, Cause I would take eight minutes a day, any day <laughs> right now I know. with the two year old and the one year old. Um, but like, you, like, you need you know. someone to tell you to do it. Like how often, right. like I used to skip this, the practice I normally do Iyengar. It's always the last week of the month they do restorative. And for years, especially in my thirties, I'm like, Oh, I can do that on my own. Why am I paying for a class for restorative? Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, I never did. <laughs> Cause I'm like, right. I never did, never any time. But when I actually started going to those restorative classes, it blew my mind. I would come out feeling like a whole new person. So while the new parent may say, you know, I can do it on their own, are they really going to, unless someone says, okay, we're setting up this pose. Don't worry about the timing. I've got you covered. I'm keeping the time in class. I'm not going to hold you late. So I think having someone hold that space to give you the permission to let go, I think it's incredibly important. Yeah, that the community and support is is vital. And I think we do undervalue that. Absolutely. Um, so I want to ask, so I know everyone is different, but generally speaking, how soon or how or when is it safe to start the postnatal yoga? Because I know there's going to be a difference between whether you did a vaginal delivery or you had a C-section. When is it usually OK to start? That's a great question, um, and I've seen a wide variety. So for a surgical birth, six weeks, because it's major abdominal surgery. Mm -hmm. Even though it's the most common surgery for women, it's still abdominal surgery. So I want to respect that healing. So that is six weeks. Now that said, I had people with surgical births try to come into class, and I set them up in restorative the whole time because it's just not appropriate mm -hmm. for them to be doing mm -hmm. as much as we do in our postnatal. And then for those that had a vaginal birth, varied, it's really when their bleeding is stopped, and that can be anywhere from three to six weeks. Okay. Um, so I do also want to ask, you mentioned earlier when we first started speaking um, that you felt like acupuncture was really beneficial to you. Um, and we haven't had anyone really speak about that as a guest yet. Um, can you just kind of give us some information how you think it helped you and why you think it's really important 
in the pregnancy phase. Yeah, I mean, or, I'm not or an trying to conceive or pregnancy. <laughs> so I'm okay. not right. an acupuncturist. So I'm going more on the fact that I have seen an acupuncturist for over 20 years. So I don't, I'm going to admit, I don't totally understand all of it. Um, but what I have, and I'll say this more anecdotally, although I did interview an acupuncturist on my podcast and she gave me some great information, um, which I don't know off the top of my head, but she talked a lot about releasing and opening the gates. Um, the gates, I'm not even sure exactly what that means, but she talked about opening the gates of energy in the body, the different meridians. So I did it for both kids. I did it um, to try to get pregnant. And then between my two kids, I did have a miscarriage. And after that, I worked with my acupuncturist again on getting pregnant. So I worked with her pretty steadily for about two months. Um, and then that happened. And then for both kids, I also saw her, I think around 38, 39 weeks to help get my body ready for birth. And so the treatments she gave was about, again, opening the gates. And it was about helping the cervix soften as well as start labor. It was a very, they were intense uh, treatments. They weren't relaxing and soft. They were, they were pretty full of sensation. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not able to give you too much of the science behind it because I'll be honest that I don't know it. But from the years of acupuncture, not just for conception, not just for pregnancy, but just for all my other aches and pains, I've just found it so incredibly effective. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's good information as well, because we just have not talked about that extensively on the podcast, and I'm sure we will soon. Um, but I just kind of, yeah, I wanted to know your your take on that, because that's actually one of the, the tips I give as well. <laughs> it's like a whole thing. Um but I do want to ask, are you still practicing as a as a birth doula? I know you have the prenatal yoga center. Okay. Yeah, you've got a lot going on. <laughs> well, I have a lot going on and I just found it really hard. I don't have family around and to drop everything on a dime if someone was going into labor. I've done like a few births since I've had my kids, but it I'd have that's back when I had a nanny and I don't now um because my kids are in school. Well, they're being schooled at home, but they're technically mm -hmm. in elementary school. Um, so I don't have that. So I do more like what I call like birth coaching that I work with people. I teach childbirth ed still more, um, more private. And then usually from that childbirth ed, it's, I become more of like a birth coach. And then I also teach a lot of teach uh, prenatal yoga teacher training. So I'm teaching yoga teachers my methodology of prenatal yoga. And then I run my yoga studio. Um, and I have two kids. So <laughs> that takes up that takes up a lot of my a lot of my time. But I'm still incredibly passionate about supporting uh, birthing people. Yeah, you definitely have a lot going on. So um, so yeah, so you do have the prenatal yoga center in New York. Tell us everything, all the classes and all the offers that you have at the studio in New York. Oh, we've got, you know, I'm really proud that we were able to move pretty much everything online. So seven days a week, every day we have a live prenatal class. And then we have what I call re-releases. So we take the morning class and we release it at least once throughout most of the time. Monday, Friday, we release it two more times. So you have three opportunities to take that class. And then they actually get the link for 24 hours. So if they sign up for the 10 o'clock and for whatever reason they don't make it, then I still send them the link and they can take that class on demand for the next 24 hours. So we've got our prenatal classes, we've got our postnatal classes, we've got our baby and me classes, we've got childbirth education. It's a one day express because I know people are in front of the camera on Zoom all the time. So we, we took the best of our childbirth ed and made it a one day intensive. Um, we've got a breastfeeding 101. We've got caring for newborn, infant safety CPR, uh, infant massage. Oh, one of the big hitters of the studio is our new mom support group because who can't use a little bit of support? Um, and then we've got, I think, oh, and then we have a class called Pushing Power, which is all about that second stage of pushing baby out and a comforting touch, which is for the partners to learn how to support and massage and use different pressure points. Um, that's led by actually an acupuncturist, a licensed acupuncturist. So we've got the comforting touch class. And then as I mentioned, our teacher training. So we've got a ton of offerings um, at PYC. Okay, tell us just a little bit um, about your team that you have and their backgrounds and how they assist at the center. 
Oh my gosh, they are the backbone. They just, I'm so incredibly blessed to have such a great team. So before the pandemic, I had a pretty healthy staff of about I think 12 other teachers. Um, and then I, I had to let many of them go. And I ended up taking over to keep this studio sustainable because we we're still paying our New York City rent um, to keep mm -hmm. the studio sustainable. I'm teaching the majority of classes, but I have two very talented teachers that teach uh, a couple classes a week. And then I've got my two assistants. So I've got Renee, who is the organizer. She can she can whip a spreadsheet into shape. She is the organizer. And then I've got Ursula, who is my creative director. So they are both the managers, co-managers, but with very different strengths. So I have one that has all the creative ideas. And then I've got the other that takes those ideas and, help in, and helps implement everything. So I'm so fortunate. And then I have a podcast. So I have my sound engineer that helps with that. And I have um, Lily, who listens to the podcast and finds the editing spots. Um, so I'm so blessed that I have such an amazing, amazing team. And of course, my husband, he, while he's not technically on our, our, um, our payroll, he is a vital part of the team that keeps me grounded and sane. That's awesome. So I do have a question for you. Um, so one of the things you mentioned, you mentioned earlier something about spinning babies, but we didn't speak yeah. about that. Um, can yeah. you just tell us a little bit about what that is? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I love spinning babies and I'm dying to do their, their educator um, program. So spinning babies looks a lot about balance of the baby, balance of the soft tissue, balance of the, uh, the uh, bony pelvis itself and looking for this, uh, this position of the baby that is uninhibited so the baby can descend and rotate well through the pelvis. It was created by uh, Gail Tully who I've been fortunate enough to speak with a couple of times. And it's a system that looks at where can we get let go of restrictions and tension so that the uterus can have its uh, natural potential to help the baby find its way out functionally and relatively quickly. So it's trying to take away some of the barriers that may show up where people say, oh, baby's too big. Sometimes not the baby's too big. It's sometimes what's happening in the uterus, what's happening with the soft tissue that may not be allowing baby to find its way through the pelvis. You can check okay. them out at spinningbabies.com. Okay. Um, so before we um, close out, my question for you is now that you are like in fully enthralled in the prenatal yoga center um, and you have kids who are older, are they actually practicing yoga with you? Do you practice it as a family? I try to. Um, they have no... <laughs> <laughs> I I really I don't understand I don't know what it is but they do my daughter every now and then will do it um but no I can't understand it I had these visions when they were little that we would do family yoga I have all these yoga props like I just thought mm -hmm. that would be our thing like we'd be the yoga family but no 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, they won't, they won't practice with me. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. I also have shifted my practice to be like early in the morning. So it's my time to really, I, I call it my lily pad. Like I get on my mat. It's like my lily pad. It's my time for my body. But mm -hmm. I do try to introduce family yoga and they still have no interest. Maybe it's yeah. when they're older. <laughs> yeah, kids definitely have a mind of their own. <laughs> Yeah, so this, this is a question that I have for you, um, especially that I've talked to. We, we interviewed someone else on the podcast and she had like six home births, no, three home births and three hospital births. Um, but just things that we traditionally have not thought about, um, usually in a traditional hospital birth, we usually like laying on our back and, you know, delivering that way. But I've become so much more aware um, of the positioning when you're actually delivering. Mm -hmm. um, did you actually, where were you laying down? Did you stand up when you gave birth? And what do you suggest to your clients? Or what did you suggest to your clients as far as that portion of delivery, as far as an option? That's a great, great question. So while I'm not um, in the birth room anymore, I'm still working with pregnant people all the time in class for prenatal yoga. And I am often, I'm not often, pretty much always saying, birth in a position that you are getting the most benefit from, what is actually making a difference. So 
Yeah, you're right. The, on the back, it's not the most physiological way to birth because you're pushing the sacrum into the outlet. You're oftentimes your knees are turned out and you're pulling your knees to your armpits, and that's actually taking your sit bones closer. So you're kind of closing the door, the exit way. Mm. So that is not an ideal position. But that said, if someone's making progress and they can really get in their body and help push their baby down, great if that's how it's working for them. But I suggest even, especially if someone has an epidural and they may not have as many options, just turning onto your side. Now the sacrum, that uh, triangular bony part of the pelvis, it's like a little trap door can move out of the way. If you take your top leg up and drop the knee down, so we're internally rotating that top leg, we're making more space in the sit bones. So I do suggest First of all, check with your care provider because what I don't want to fill anyone's head with all these options, but then the care provider just not feel comfortable with catching and delivering that way. So have a conversation, negotiate your, your birthing positions ahead of time, but know that there are options. I've had clients face the back of the bed when the bed is propped up with their knees closer together and their feet wide, which is again, widening the sit bones. The sacrum has space. So I'm often saying, look at your birth positions, talk to your care provider, understand what's on the table, what's not, and then ultimately do where you're do with what you're most comfortable with and you're making progress. Now from my first birth, since I pushed for what felt like years, um, <laughs> we tried we tried literally every position. Um, I think I finally I think I was on my back. I think it was because I was exhausted. I'd been hours and I was kind of on my back rolling slightly to my side. Um, I was convinced he was never coming out. With my <laughs> daughter, I remember reaching up and grabbing my head, the headboard, these, these bars, and kind of rolling to the side and pulling on them and pushing her out. But it was literally like one or two pushes. It wasn't, it wasn't that much. But that was, I mean, like this deep open like i remember it's like like it felt very um cathartic to to mm. kind of roar her out that way and get my body <laughs> in me that's great information thank you so much so tell everyone how they can get in contact with you they can get get more information about your classes and all the services that the prenatal yoga center offers great yeah sure um everyone can find uh prenatal yoga center at our website, prenatalyogacenter.com. You can check our schedule. You can look at all our workshops. You can follow us on so think everything. I think we're on Twitter, prenatal yoga center on Instagram, prenatal yoga center on Facebook, uh, prenatal yoga center. I've got a podcast called yoga birth babies. And I think, and of course you can always just email info at prenatal yoga center.com. So <laughs> we weren't very original in the name. It was just very, very <laughs> obvious what we do. Um, and that's how you can find us. Just look up prenatal yoga center. That is awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing all your wealth of information. It's been a joy Thank to you. have you. Um, and I will definitely put your information in the show notes. And if anyone has any questions, you can always just tag this post and I will do my best to forward them over to Deb. But thank you, Deb. Again, I know it's in the evening and you've taken time with your family. So I will let you get back. But thank you so thank much for joining you. us. Um, and I wish you the best of luck, um, continued success and luck with um, the Prenatal Yoga Center. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.